How's it going everybody? My name is Isaiah, this is Oregon Rockworks, and today I want to give you a little walkthrough of the polishing process, give you a sense of my workflow. I've picked up a bunch of new rocks recently, I've been busy doing other stuff, I haven't done a batch of polish work in a while, so I'll sort of walk you through start to finish. I won't go into details of how I'm doing everything, but it should give you a, at least an idea of um, how I work through a stack of rocks. So let me bring you over here, I'll show you what I'm planning to work on today, and uh, show you the next step. Here's what I'm hoping to work through today. I've had these Frida eggs for a couple months now, just haven't got around to them, but everything else I'm going to show here, I just picked up yesterday. So the first step with any slab is to figure out which side you want to polish. Looking at this one, trying to figure out which side is better, I like to mark the side that I don't want to polish with an X, that way I don't sand away my mark. There's no confusion as to whether I polished the right side or not. This is Van Dusen Jasper from Oregon. In the case of this piece, I am going to put an X on this side because I've got a pretty major fracture going right through the best pattern in the piece. And over on this side, it's sort of shifted into this darker area. So. That one I'm going to polish this side, and then my next step is going to be grinding this tab off. I'll do all these at once in a big batch. I was very excited to pick up a lot of grassy mountain petrified wood from southeast Oregon. Particularly, I got some full limbs and some full round slabs. It's some of Oregon's best. I mean, just look at that color in detail. This particular one is an end cut, so no guesswork there. We'll polish the cut side. This one here, I'm trying to decide which is better. Ooh, it's a toss up. Here's a small but very cool dry head agate slice. I've gone back and forth a bunch of times which side is better. I like the two fortification pockets on this side, but I really like these eyes on this side and this big cavity. Ooh, I think I'm gonna do this side. I think that's my favorite. This is a really cool cross section of a limb cast from the Crooked River in Central Oregon. Ooh, unfortunately, this has a really rough cut on it. If I had a larger vibratory lap or a slow speed rotary lap, I might be able to grind this down flat, but with a high speed sander, it's gonna take too much time to mess with this today. So that one's gonna get put on the back burner. This is some of the highest quality gem dino bone I've had. It's so vibrant and also translucent, which is pretty rare. Uh, I know this would cut exceptional cabs, but I wanna look at it under my digital microscope. Uh, it doesn't show up very well unpolished, and if I were to cab it, it also won't show up very well because that microscope really only focuses on flat surfaces. So I'm going to do a flat polish on this bigger side. I'm pretty excited about that. I think it's gonna turn out really cool. All right, I got my water flowing. I'm gonna quickly grind off any tabs on these rocks before I move over to the sander. Well, I got a little carried away there and I ran through the rest of those pieces. First, I took all the saw marks out on this 100 grit disc and then I took the scratches from that out with this 400 grit belt. Uh, so those pieces are all now ready for cerium oxide. Um, some materials don't respond well to this disc. Uh, dinosaur bone in particular, there's something weird about it. I'll go into that in more detail down the line. But my progression for that is to run a 100 grit belt instead to get the saw marks out. And then same deal, run the 400 grit to get these scratches out. Uh, I don't like doing that quite as well. Uh, the nice thing about the disc is that it keeps the surface of your rock dead flat, which I appreciate. I want my polish to reflect light in a perfect plane. Uh, and when you run these more aggressive belts, that uh, polished face tends to round over a little bit at the edges. I just don't like it quite as well. When I'm doing my pre-polish, I like to have all my scratches running the same direction. Hopefully this shows up on camera, but all of my scratches are running in this direction. Mm, 
think you can kind of see it there in the glare. So what that allows me to do is run the cerium kind of across those scratches. I'll move it around a little bit because I don't want to hold still in one position too long. But that way it really takes away all the guesswork. When I can't see any more streaking going this way, I know I've pulled out all my scratches. So here's a piece that I did years ago, same material as this one. And uh, yeah, just look at the difference in the reflections here. This is done in the exact same process, but this has been hit with cerium oxide, and it's got that great glassy finish, whereas this one is so frosty and hazy. You can see the scratches. Um, so just a really cool visual to see what a dramatic effect it has on it, and the fact that it can pull all those scratches and take you from a surface like this to a surface like that in one step is just pretty cool. It kind of feels like magic. So that's pretty much it. I'll show you a quick clip of me running the polisher, but there's really not much to see. It's just kind of boring and takes a while. And then I'll shoot them all with this little electric pressure washer to make sure I get all the serum out of any pits and voids and cracks. Um, and that's it. So I'll bring you back and we'll look at all the finished pieces and maybe give you some final comments. And then really quick, I want to just talk about the science of cerium oxide. I learned this just this last week. I always had a suspicion that there was something weird going on. It's not just abrasion. I understand how diamond and silicon carbide abrasives work. It's removing material, leaving a finer and finer scratch pattern. But I always thought cerium oxide was a little funky because you're going from this 400 grit scratch pattern and somehow it just smooths it all over. It almost looks like it melts the surface, uh, turns it all glassy and liquid, liquid shiny. So turns out there's a whole field of industry uh, called CMP or chemical mechanical polishing, sometimes also called chemical metal polishing or sometimes also called chemical metal planarization. Uh, Cerium oxide was developed in the optics industry, I don't know how long ago, but long ago for polishing lenses for telescopes and glasses and lenses. And this chemical mechanical polishing is used in the semiconductor industry to get silicon wafers perfectly flat and very polished. Uh, so the big reveal to me is that I was kind of right. I didn't know what was going on, but there is a chemical reaction happening. It's not just mechanical abrasion. Uh, so it turns out the cerium oxide reacts with the silica dioxide, right? Almost everything I'm polishing is made of quartz, jasper, agate, petrified wood, opal even, is mostly quartz, lots of silicon dioxide. So the cerium oxide with the water reacts with the silicon dioxide. It breaks the bonds between the silicon and oxygen and makes this really micro thin hydrolyzed layer that's super soft. And then the cerium is able to do that polishing and abrasion quickly and effectively. So it's not exactly melting the surface, but it is breaking down the surface uh, on a very small level. And that kind of explains how something that doesn't seem to be super abrasive can take these scratches out and leave you with this liquid shiny finish. So I thought that was pretty cool uh, and it intuitively makes sense. I wanted to also add that explains why cerium oxide works so well for quartz based materials and doesn't work at all for other things. Like uh, you'll see some Frida eggs that have calcite in them. They're actually gonna look better coming off of the 400 grit silicon carbide than they will after cerium, just the calcite crystals specifically, uh, because that reaction can't take place with calcite because there's no silicon dioxide to break down. Um, so I'm, my hunch is, and I need to research a little more, that all of these oxides, tin oxide, chrome oxide, cerium oxide, are all working on somewhat of a similar process. So with things that are softer and not silica based, like Indian paint stone is a good example, or calcite, rhodochrosite, fluorite, I would guess. Um, running diamond all the way through uh, is more of a surefire way to get a better polish because diamond will obviously cut anything and uh, running something like that up to five, 10, 15,000 diamond should uh, hopefully approach the result we're getting with cerium. But because of this chemical reaction with these quartz-based materials, 
we're able to cut out all those steps and just, phew, it, it's like magic. So here's a Frida egg that is pre-polished. Got all my scratches running this way. And here's a big pocket of calcite. Let me see if I can catch the glare there. Obviously there are still some scratches. It's difficult to polish anyway because of all those cleavage planes. But I actually think it's shinier now than it will be after I polish with cerium oxide. So I'll show you this same piece when it's all done. Okay, I got it all finished. This piece I did not finish, everything else here is done. Just to give you a sense of scale, this probably took me three plus hours of actual labor time if I weren't pausing to film along the way. I'm really happy with the way these pieces turned out. Uh, there's a few that I'm especially excited about, but I'll just sort of go through them all one at a time, make a few comments, observations, and then I would also like to look at a select few under the digital microscope to highlight some smaller details. Here are two cool nodules of Heart Mountain Jasper. This one here is a domed polish. I did this with diamond wheels. You can see the way the light rolls. It's not quite a flat polish surface, but how cool is that? Colorful picture Jasper floating in a shell of agate. Really stoked on that. And then this piece here is actually flat. Cool mix of colors, brecciated jasper, wild looking exterior. All right, let's take a look at these three Frida eggs. I might've been a little bit wrong saying that the calcite looks better after 400 grit silicon carbide. It's pretty shiny after cerium. It's just, you know, it's not as hard as agate, so it doesn't quite reflect light the same way but it looks good. What a cool mix of colors and textures in here. These are probably my favorite of all the Oregon Thunder eggs. This one too, just awesome. Like curtains of moss. A Little bit of calcite down here. Decent sized piece. And this one here. It's just got it all. Colorful inclusions, waterline, fortification agate, quartz crystals, calcite crystals. Is that a scratch there? It is. This is where I caught an edge when I was grinding with my diamond wheel. And somehow I missed that. Shame on me. That's a, that's a pretty major problem. I don't know how I missed that. This little dry head agate slab turned out awesome. You can see the quartz crystals don't polish up quite as nice as agate, and so when you catch the glare there, you do see those tiny pits of those open spaces between the crystals. But uh, cool colors, great pattern. What's not to like? This is a trio of limbs from Grassy Mountain. I'm not sure which is my favorite. Probably this one. This one's got a fracture over here, not as much color. I do like this one a lot as well. This is just great wood. It is such hard agate. Yeah, I think I probably like this one the best, but they're all cool. A few more from Grassy Mountain. The white in this one is kind of unusual. I'll show you this one in a little bit under the microscope. This has got some really cool, uh, fine structural details. And this piece here is an end cut. But hopefully you guys can pick up on what makes this stuff so great. It's just a dream lapidary material. Solid, colorful. Love it. This one gave me some trouble. It's shiny, but I did not get the scratches out. I think there are probably much better ways to polish dinosaur bone than the sander that I'm using. Sometimes I nail it, but a lot of times it gives me problems and it doesn't come out looking nearly like I hope it would. Uh, I don't know that I showed this one earlier, but this one actually turned out a little better, uh, especially this top part here. Really cool details. And the polish on this one came out real nice. Here are some pieces of Van Dusen Jasper. Once again, just a cool mix of colors. 
I don't see this type of, I don't know, pinkish orange very often in Jasper. These look great. The fine details in here are sweet under the microscope. And last one to round it out. One more piece of Van Dusen. This bottom half is really good. I love how the color shifts with each successive orb as you work from right to left here. This piece of bone looks pretty good. I do notice some, uh, some scratches, like in here. Uh, everything looks worse under the microscope, but cool. Love those details. Love the contrast. That one came out nice. This piece of bone is the only major disappointment. I did a terrible job. All these scratches I should have removed. And then you'll also notice these kind of fissure looking things running this way. That's not for me. I didn't run my belt that direction. Uh, I've noticed that certain materials, but especially high quality gem bone, can sometimes tear on a very microscopic level when it's being cut with a lapidary saw. Uh, it doesn't look as bad down here. That's just scratches from my crappy polish. Um, but I really do notice it, like in here. You see these kind of, uh, yeah, they look more like tears than they do scratches. Anyway, I might work at this one again because it is such good bone. Uh, kind of breaks my heart to see it like this. But, oh, cool rock. And then you just got to see some of these colors and details in this Van Dusen Jasper. Colors you just don't see very often in Jaspers. Oh, how cool is that? This one's a little little dusty, but polish came out well on this. I mean, look at that. So bold, so crispy. A lot of times Jaspers on this type of magnification look sort of blurry. This is like sharp as can be. Oh man, how cool is that? That's a cool piece. And finally, Look at that. I apologize, this is not the best way to show this, but hopefully it at least gives you an idea of some of the contrast and details I'm admiring. Those colors are sweet. Anyway, here's the last thing I wanna show under the scope. This is that grassy mountain slice with some white in it. Just awesome details. And uh, I don't see any imperfections with the polish here. I've always said this is one of the easiest things to work. It just polishes effortlessly and there's a little fracture, but I've, I've been zooming around this one. I can't find any mo even minor flaws, which probably also contributes to why I love this material. It makes me feel like I have skills. Isn't that cool? Well, there you have it. Thank you all so much for watching. If you've made it this far, I certainly do appreciate it. If you've got uh, further questions or insights about the science and technique of polishing rocks, I would love to hear them. I'd be happy to answer questions to the best of my ability. I don't know everything, but I am learning and continuing to get better. Uh, other than that, stay tuned for the next one. I am planning to do a roundup of the petrified wood localities of the Pacific Northwest and let me know what else you'd like to see in the future. Thank you all so much. Have a great day.